Okay, today we're going to talk about an attorney. Oh, yeah, I know what you're thinking. The truth about attorneys, right, is now said about politicians. Do you know when a politician's lying? His lips are moving. Hey, you know what? The attorney actually went to the client that he's representing, and he's a criminal uh, defense attorney, and, and he says to his client, I got some good news and I got some bad news. And his defendant says, well, I'll take the bad news first. He said, well, the bad news is there was blood all over the crime scene, and it's got your DNA all over it. He said, well, that's terrible. What about the good news? He said, well, the same report shows that your cholesterol is at 130. <laughs> We're going to talk about attorneys today. The greatest of all attorney, attorneys, and we're going to talk about Jesus. I want to do a quick review before we uh, dive into our topic, though, today. Last week we started in 1 John chapter 1 and said, what you really need to know, because almost on an average, every two and a half verses, the word know pops up in this book. Uh, sometimes it occur, occurs three times in a single verse, and then, but sometimes it's just spread out evenly through the whole book. John really wants you to really, really know something. And last week we saw what it was. He really wants you to know that Jesus Christ is real. He's been handled, touched, seen, heard, felt, spoken to, spoken back. And, and he's, all these senses, he said, empirical verification from eyewitnesses verified that Jesus Christ is real. That's because he's writing because there's a heresy arising called Gnosticism, which said that basically, if I boil it down to real simplistic terms, is anything physical is evil and anything spiritual is good. And if that principle is true, then Jesus couldn't have taken a body because the body is evil, so he never came in the flesh. And John is trying to say, no, 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 no. You see, when, when God created mankind, he created Adam with a physical body, and he was sinless. Sinless. The body was not evil. It was the choice that he made that made evil come into the, the human race. For as whereby one man's sin, death entered into the world, and death by sin, so death passed upon all men because all sin, we all sinned in Adam. But Jesus Christ is real. That's his argument as he starts the book. Eternal life is real, second, he says, because Jesus Christ is eternal life. He has eternal life within himself. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life, and here's the words, in Christ Jesus our Lord. It is in him. He has eternal life. Third thing that we noticed was that fellowship is, with God is real. You can actually walk with God. You can abide in him. You can remain in him. You can live in him. That's different ways they try to translate this one concept of meno in the Greek language. You can have a relationship with God, and if you're not, you're missing the whole purpose for which you were created. God wants to have a personal relationship with you. And then the last thing we saw last time was that deception, self-deception, is real. You can fool yourself that you're a Christian when you're not. Ooh, that would be a terrible place to be. Claiming to be a Christian when you are not, and then one day standing before God and saying, I never knew you. Whoa, that'd be a terrible place to be. Self-deception. In fact, in the Proverbs 2 times, chapter 12 and chapter 14, it says, there is a way that seems right unto a man, but the end thereof is the way of death. It seems like everything I'm doing is good and God's going to bless me, but the end is death. See, you can be sincere about what you think and be sincerely wrong. It's about really knowing Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. John has just said in chapter 1, last verse, verse 10, if we claim we have not sinned, that's why I got that no sign over the big dark blotch in my life of sin. Whoa. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar. Why? Because God said, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Wow. He said, we make him out to be a liar, and his word has no place in our lives. You can say whatever you want to say about how wonderful and good you are, but if you claim that you have not sinned, you lie and the truth is not in you, 
and his word is not in you. He picks up in the next verse, chapter 2, verse 1. There were no original chapter divisions in the Bible when they wrote this. You do know that, right? And so this is a letter, and so he's just continuing right along. He's continuing right along. He says, my dear children, I write this to you. Now, he never tells us who they are that he's writing to because it's a general epistle. It was good to anyone who read it. So it's, this is to you, he's saying. My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. You see, God does not want us to sin. When, he, uh, when Jesus healed the, the man that was, uh, he was uh, lame and, and he couldn't walk and, and he was trying to get into the water and Jesus came along and said, hey, do you want to get well? And the man said, I don't have anybody put me in the water. Wrong answer. Jesus said, do you want to get well? And the right answer was, yes. But he said, no, I don't have anybody who will put me in the water. And, and so then, then Jesus says, take up your mat and walk. And he healed him. And then Jesus said, go and sin no more. Ooh. God does not want us to sin. Remember the woman that was caught in adultery? And uh, they were going to stone her, and uh, Jesus says to them, you know, they ask him, uh, what does the law say regarding this woman who's an adulterous woman? Jesus got down on the ground and wrote in the, in the dust, the sand. Nobody knows what he wrote. But some believe that he was doing the Ten Commandments. And then he got down to the one, thou shalt not commit adultery. And he got a little bit further, thou shalt not covet. You know, he put them all down. Maybe he just put the numbers of them. They all knew them. And they, one by one, they left. They fled. And, and then he stands up and he says, where are all your accusers? And, and the woman said, uh, there are none of them are here, Lord. And then Jesus said to him, neither do I condemn you. But then he adds this, go and sin no more. God does not want us to sin. My dear children, I write to you so that you will not sin. And then he adds, but if anybody does sin. Ugh. <laughs> now you and I know that we don't want to sin and every day. Every day you get up, you don't want to sin. I mean, because, but do you sin? Oh, yeah. Somebody cuts you off? A little road rage incites inside of you? You want to give them a little, you know, the Italian salute? And, uh, or you, out of your mouth come some uh, profanities and you don't know where in the world those came from. But you say, how many times a day? He said, but if anybody does sin, that would be you and me, folks. Anybody does sin, here we go. You need a real attorney. <laughs> the wages of sin is death. You are in big, deep, deep doo-doo <laughs> if you sin. Whoa. You need a real attorney. Why do you need a real attorney? Because you are a sinner. That's why you need an attorney. You need somebody to represent you, somebody to take your case, somebody to defend you. But if anyone does sin, that's you and me. I'm a sinner, you're a sinner. It's not just the things that we have committed. Do you know that in James it says, to him that knows to do good, you know it's the right thing to do, but he does not do it. You will admit it doing what you should do. To him it is sin. You're driving along the road. You see a guy broke down on the side. You think, well, maybe I should stop and help him. No, maybe I should give him a, a call to 911. Let him know there's somebody on the side of the road. And you don't do either. To him that knows to do good and does it not, it is sin. It's not just the things we commit, it's the things we omit that we should be doing. Now here's a bigger one yet. In the book of Romans chapter 14, last verse says, anything not done in faith is sin. Whoa. Anything not done in faith is sin. Do you see why the Bible says all have sinned? Do you see what the problem is? But if anyone does sin, we all sin. And this, this, this passage is so important because all those sins are against me. 
Every now and then, you know, when I'm sharing my faith with someone, we're talking a little bit about the sin problem that we have. I'll say, imagine, because a person told me they think they're a good person and that they're, you know, their good will outweigh their bad and that everything will be fine. And I'll just say, hey, suppose you were really a good, 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 good person, you know, like uh, Billy Graham, Mother Teresa, and you only sinned one time a day. Okay? At the end of the year, you've got 365 offenses that are all worthy of death. And you're telling me the good you've done is out going to wait. No, it doesn't work that way. He said, but if anyone sins, he says, you need an attorney because you, you're a sinner and you have an accuser. There's somebody there pointing their finger at you and saying, look what you did. The accuser in the book of Revelation, chapter 12, is Satan himself. And it says, the devil is the accuser of our brothers who accuses them before God day and night. In the book of Job, chapter 1, Satan has been going to and through the earth, through the earth and he goes into the presence of God and God allows him to come into his presence. And so where have you been? He said, I've been going through the whole earth. And, and uh, then he says, hey, and he's making accusations that nobody loves God. And he said, oh, have you considered my servant Job? Poor Job doesn't know there's a contest now going on. And he's the pawn in the game. And uh, he, Satan is the accuser. And if I can boil it down and kind of paraphrase what it says, God, and he's accusing Job, he only serves you because you bless him. If you took his blessing away, he wouldn't, he wouldn't serve you. He is making accusations against good old Job. In the second chapter, he says, comes back into his present, and he says, oh, he's only, he's only trusting in you and loving you and believing in you because he's got good health. And God says, you can do anything to him, but don't take his life. Oh, my goodness, this guy's covered with boils from the bottom of his head all the way to the top. Bottom of his feet, top of his head, and, and everything terrible has happened. He's lost his family, he's lost his wealth, he's lost everything, and yet he loves the Lord. <laughs> Satan, according to the book of Revelation, he goes in and he accuses us. He goes into the presence of God and says, oh, do you see what Pastor Dennis Henderson did down there? And he claims to be a pastor. <laughs> yeah. He goes into God's presence and accuses you. There's an accuser. He sees what you have done. And Satan himself accuses us day and night, day and night. You see, you need a real attorney because of the judge. If anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father. You step before the Father. Now, in Genesis 18, it says, will not the judge of the earth do what is just or right? And the judge of the earth is God, God the Father. God the Father is the judge and when you sin, you are guilty before God the Father, and the wages of our sin is death, and we're not in a very good situation, but we have an attorney. Here's the good news, folks. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate, a paraclete, a paracoleto, someone who's called alongside to represent us. I, I chose the English Standard Version here because the New International Version puts it as, we have someone there to defend us. And that's exactly what he does. But I like the term advocate. He's my advocate. He's my representative. He's my attorney. So he's standing there right next to me. It's Jesus Christ, the righteous. He is so right, he has never lost a case. Isn't that great? That's my attorney standing there right by me. He's come alongside, and he's going to defend me even though I'm the guilty sinner. I have Jesus Christ. I have the right attorney. He's qualified on my side. You see, you do need a winning attorney. If you don't have Jesus Christ when you stand before God and you're there on your own, you've got to make your own case. Romans chapter 3 says, every mouth will be stopped and the whole world will become guilty before God. Whoa. So you think, I'm going to defend myself? You're going to go like, nothing's coming out. <laughs> you have no case. You need a winning attorney. 
You need one who will satisfy justice. You see, Jesus, he is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. The attorney's taken care of everything. Isn't that great? My attorney's taking care of everything. Now, the word atoning sacrifice, uh, the word here is a word that theologians will tell you there's no adequate description in English for this concept. There's just no adequate description. They choose things like expediate, propitiate, atoning, uh, but they say none of them really capture the full force of the word here that he is the atoning sacrifice. The King James Version has and he is the propitiation. And I like that term because nobody uses it anymore. <laughs> if I were to say, hey, be propitious, you'd say, what? Uh, propitiation. The idea here is you appease the wrath of God. God is satisfied with the justice that has been done. That's the whole idea. God's outraged holiness and, and, and wrath towards sin has been satisfied that justice of my guilt it is it's satisfied i i just love this term here's a propitiation for our sins but i want to illustrate it because the same word propitiation is used in hebrews chapter 9 for part of the ark of the covenant very interesting here i got the ark of the covenant or a picture of it most people say, well, where is it today? Well, if you saw the movie Indiana Jones, you know that it is in some warehouse in Washington uh, stored away. Of course, that's not true. We don't know where it is, but it looks something like this from the description in the Bible. It was a box. It was a box. And it says, where in, inside of it, was the golden pot of manna? So back when the nation Israel was in the wilderness and God brought manna every day and provided for the, the nation. They were instructed to take a pot of the manna. Now, the manna wouldn't last. You realize the manna wouldn't last. But it would when they put it in the pot and they put it inside the covenant, Ark of the Covenant. He said inside the Ark of the Covenant was the pot of manna. Also inside was Aaron's rod that budded. Remember, Aaron had a rod and it would bloom. It was a, a dead rod, but it would bloom. So, we have God's provision for life in manna. We got God taking and giving life to that which is dead. And, and, and it's, put inside, it's put inside the Ark of the Covenant. And then there was the tablets of the covenant. The Ten Commandments written on two tablets. Remember Moses broke the ones, uh, both of them actually. And, and then God had, he wrote them all over again. And then they brought them down from the mountain. And they were placed inside the Ark of the Covenant. Okay. And so the box was like that, and it had, it had this lid on it, and they took and they put the pot of manna, they put the, the rod of Aaron that blossomed, and they put the Ten Commandments in it, and then they closed the lid, and that was a storage case. And, and for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, that manna was good inside that box. For hundreds and hundreds of years, that rod it bloomed, it blossomed, and for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, the Ten Commandments were inside that box. Now, this is all really important. The Ten Commandments is the will of God. The Ten Commandments is the law of God. And God is king. Israel had no king. God was their king. That was his law. There was a penalty for breaking that law. The penalty was death. We know that. It was death. So, the next verse says, and over it, the box, the, all that stuff inside the box, were cherubim. Two cherubim, if you read the Old Testament, beaten out of a single piece of gold that arched so that their wings touched in the middle. And so that was really important because once a year, the high priest would go into this place and he would have to take blood and sprinkle it on the next thing we're going to see here. On the mercy seat, the lid of the Ark of the Covenant is called the mercy seat. In the Greek language, you know what they call that? Hilasterion. You know what hilasterion is translated as? The place of, per of propitiation. The place of propitiation. Now we're getting to my back to my word. 
that Jesus was an atoning sacrifice, my attorney's atoning sacrifice. He's a propitiation. You see, what took place there, the high priest, once a year, he would go in with blood, and he would sprinkle it, finding the top of that, the angel's wings there, and he'd sprinkle it down on the mercy seat, and the blood would cover the top of the mercy seat, the propitiation place, and it would be a propitiation so that it represented that God was satisfied with the shedding of this animal blood as a substitute for you for one year because you broke my law and the wage of sin was death. And symbolically, that animal's blood symbolically covers that for now. And God satisfied for one year in the symbolism. But the book of Hebrews goes on to say that Jesus Christ came once at the end of the age to make a sacrifice of himself to forever put away our sins. John the Baptist, when he saw Jesus coming, said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Jesus is the one, his blood was truly shed and spilt on the mercy seat to make propitiation so that the holy God who actually inhabited above, above the mercy seat and the, and the, between the two angels, there was the Shekinah glory of the Lord, a fulgence of light, a brightness that manifested the presence of God. He would look down and he would see the blood covering the broken law because it's the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, by symbolism, that takes away the sin of the world. Whew. All of that to say, I've got a winning, I've got a winning attorney he is the atoning sacrifice. The guy representing me says, I paid for it already. I paid the debt. He gets to go scot-free. I paid for it. Not for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. Listen, Jesus just shows, there you are, you're in court, and you're being prosecuted, and the prosecutor is a devil, he's accusing you. And you got an attorney there with you, and the judge, the judge is just and holy and will sentence you. And, and, and then all of a sudden, Jesus stands up and he just shows his wounds. He said, For him, I died. I paid it all in full. He gets to go free. You see, in Christianity, justice is satisfied in the cross. All the justice, you see. Jesus paid in full the price of my judgment. And he stands up and represents me. And he says, oh, look, it's already been paid for. Already been paid for. Paid in full. But you know, we need a personal attorney. It's, it's okay to know about the attorney. Hey, and he's available. You know, if you get in some kind of legal trouble, you can look through... In the old days, you look through the yellow pages for an attorney. Today, you'd scroll online, and, and then you would check to see all the referrals that were underneath that, or you'd ask word of mouth, who's a good attorney, and because if you don't personally know one. But if you personally know one, you say, hey, I know one. You need a personal attorney. He says, we know that we have come to know him if we obey his commandments. The man who says, I know him but does not, and does not do what he commands, is a liar and the truth is not in him. Look, the point I want to make here is you need to know him. Now, there are at least two words for know in the Greek language. Oida, which is an intuitive knowledge, you just, you just know. I mean, when you were born, you just knew that your heart needed to beat. <laughs> you just knew that. Your brain sent that signal. You just knew that. Uh, you knew that you needed to breathe. You just knew. Well, then later, you learn to hold your breath. Okay? You learn to hold your breath. Okay? Because you just knew you needed to breathe, but you learn how to hold your breath. And uh, I had a youngster that would stand at the top of the stairs, and he'd get angry, and he would just hold his breath. I knew if he was at the top of the stairs, I had to go towards the bottom because I was going to catch him. He'd hold until he was at stubborn, okay? And, and, but he learned the, the, that the word here for know is gnosko, not oida, gnosko, which means to know by experience. 
You have an experience relationship. We know that we have come to experience a relationship with him, with Jesus. You see, I could stand here and say, I know President Biden. I know who he is too. I know who he is. Of course, that is not, I know him. I mean, I know about him. And a lot of people know about Jesus. But the passage here is not talking about knowing about. It's about actually knowing him who is the advocate who will plead your case so that when you sin, he represents you. He says, to know him, to know him. First of all, you need a personal attorney, Jesus Christ, whom you know. And Jesus, I believe it's in the Sermon on the Mount where he, he talks about in that day there's going to be they're going to come and say, hey, but did we not prophesy in your name? And did we not cast out demons in your name? And did we not do wonderful works in your name? And he's going to say, depart from me because I don't know you. I never knew you. Who, who are you? You may have done all these things, all these works, but if you don't know me, depart from me. I never knew you. I never knew you. You've got to know him. You've got to know him. So I say know him. Know your attorney. Secondly, you need to obey him. We know that we have come to know him if we obey his commands. If we do what he commands. What did he command? Jesus said, well, hey, these are the two great commands. To love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. You love God. Every bit of you. He's saying He's trying to grab everything that you are. You love the Lord. And then he said, and you love your neighbor as yourself. You love other people. You see, if you do those two things, if you love God with all your heart, and you love your neighbor as yourself, you will will obey the Ten Commandments. You will. You just naturally do that. It's not because you have to. It's because... Well, because I love Jesus, I'm going to live for Jesus. I'm going to treat other people like, like they are Jesus. And I'm, I'm not going to covet my neighbor's things. I'm not going to lust after my neighbor's wife. I'm not going to lie. I'm not going to take his stuff. Why? Because I love the Lord so much. It's not that i got to do or not do these things. It's because I love the Lord. It will just automatically flow from me. So you need to obey him. You need to obey him. By loving him. You see, but if anyone obeys his word, God's love is truly made complete in him. That's what I was just saying. If I truly love the Lord, I'm going to keep all his, his desires, his wishes, his commands. If I got the love of him in me. So I'm saying, love the Lord. Put him first. Love the Lord. This is how we know that we are in him. I, I, I put here, you've got to believe in him. You've got to believe in him. If any man be, quote, in Christ, let's hear this text says, this is how we know we are in him. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. The old is gone, the new has come. His life is totally transformed from the inside out. And if it hasn't been transformed from the inside out, you probably really don't know him. Wow. You're like this passage. It's just talking about. You know about him, but you don't know him. This is how we know that we are in it. We believe in him. I'm a new creature in Christ. He says you've got to abide in him. Whoever claims to live in him must walk as Jesus did. Listen, I'm pulling up the English Standard Version because I like this. Whoever says he abides abides in him. The Greek word is meno, it means to remain, to abide. Uh, modern translate, translations put it to live, that, that you're having this living relationship. The whole idea of abiding and remaining is, is being plugged into. In John 15, Jesus said, my father is the, the vine dresser and I am the vine. Any branch in me that bears not fruit, he takes it away and every branch in me that bears fruit he prunes it that it might bring forth more fruit. And he says, now you are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me. Remain in me. 
our concept today, because we're not from like the vineyard group of people and we're not growing our grapes, we're just buying the wine already in the store. It's a, but our, our metaphor today would be to be plugged in. You take the extension cord and you plug it. I'm plugged in, so I am getting a, a relation, a flowing relationship from Jesus. Years ago, I was building a new chalk easel. Some of you know I'm a chalk artist, and I was building this new chalk easel and getting the lights. You know, I'm not an electrician, but I'm wiring the lights, and my younger brother Dave is helping me. And uh, I'm, I know I got to hook up two wires, and so I'm going to strip them, and I'm young, and I'm going to put it in my mouth and just bite it and strip the wires. I did that as he's plugging it in. Whoa, there was power. See, now, th- th- you get the picture? Yeah, I, I kind of yelled at my brother. <laughs> Come to think of it, I might have pounded him a little bit. <laughs> that thing, when, when I bit it, it bit me right back. <sighs> I'm saying this. You see what he's talking about? Being plugged into Jesus. When you are plugged into Jesus, Jesus is plugged into you, you're going to get a current Not electrical current. (laughs) Wouldn't that be nice? Woo! But you're going to get a current of love. The love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who is given unto us. Listen, it's going to change our lives, but if you're not plugged into them, your life is just mediocre, mundane, same old, same old, and and, and there's nothing. You're always lacking, never, never being fulfilled and filled. Whoever claims to live in him that, that you are connected with him, watch what it says. He must, if you believe it, he claimed to live in him, he must walk as Jesus did. So I got those two sets of footprints out there. You're following in the footsteps of Jesus. You're walking as Jesus did. Paul says, be a follower of me as I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. Dad should be saying, hey, kids, follow me as I'm following Jesus. Mom should be saying, hey, kids, follow me as I'm following Jesus. People we care about, hey, follow me as I'm following Jesus. Listen, you've got to learn, if you're not walking with Jesus, nobody else is going to walk with Jesus with you. You walk with Jesus. The idea of walking is you take a step at a time. One step, one step. It doesn't say run with Jesus. If it were a run and a race, you couldn't keep up. But you can walk with Jesus. You can walk with Jesus. So what can we take away from this passage today? I've got a few things that we can take away. Jesus is our winning advocate. You need him as your defense attorney. No one else will do. Don't try to represent yourself. There are six signs here that he is personally my advocate. These signs are so clear. I know him. I don't just know about him. I have a relationship with him. He speaks to me through the word of God daily, and I speak back to him in prayer. I got a relationship. I I can't help but talk about him because I want to obey him. It's my desire. Uh, I don't even have to try. I just do because I know him. I want to please him. And so as a result, I'm obeying him. Listen. I love him. I love him. When was the last time you prayed and you said, Lord Jesus, I love you? I love you, Lord. I love you, Lord. I believe in him. I trust him. I'm counting on him. I'm relying on him. Even if the path is difficult, I'm I'm trusting you, God. That you're somehow, if I'm going through a flood of water, you're going to part the waters. If I'm going through fiery flames of trials, you're somehow going to be there with me and I'm going to come through with not even a hair on my head singed. I'm trusting you. I believe. I believe in you, Lord Jesus. I abide. I am plugged into Jesus. and Jesus is plugged into me. And I walk like him. I walk like him. When I was uh, pastoring at the First Baptist Church of Pontiac, there was a man in the church, I said, if there's anybody I've ever met 
that represents and resembles what I think Jesus to be. His name was, my name's Dennis. He was good old Mr. Wilson. <laughs> There's a man in the church named Mr. Wilson. And uh, he would always say, hello, Dennis, when I'd come through the door, because he always greeted. He kept a list and track of people. He knew who was there, who was missing. He knew what their prayer concerns were, and he could ask you. He was really good at this. And I'd always say when he'd say, well, good morning, Dennis. I'd say, well, hello, Mr. Wilson. <laughs> and we had a great connection, but he was a godly man. At his funeral, at his funeral, they put his Bible right next to the casket. Every single page of that Bible had its own personal study notes. Every page. Didn't matter. You flip it anywhere. It was marked, and this Bible was so loaded. My wife saw that. So my wife has decided to do this. She has a Bible. Every time I do a series, she rotates Bibles. She brings them to church, and she takes notes in them, and every one of them, she's got one for every grandkid. So that when the good Lord either takes us in the rapture or we die, each one gets the Bible with her notes. And she'll even put in there a special note on a page just to them, okay? Because she knows who that's going to. Listen, this is a person who's walking with the Lord. My wife does. She walks with the Lord. A person who's walking with the Lord and, and, and having a real relationship and that's, that's what we take away from all this. I have an advocate. I got a personal attorney who represents me. I got to love this guy. I got to love him with all my heart, obey him, abide in him, believe in him, trust him. I need to know him better. Whew. And you can do that. So let's pray. Father in heaven, we are so thankful that we have our advocate, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And when our accuser comes before the throne and accuses us, he just shows his wounded hands and just says, for him, I died. We know that he told us, go and sin no more. And Lord, we are sinners. And until the day we are glorified, we are going to sin. But Lord, help us not deliberately do so. Lord, to do so so frequently. May we spend more time walking with you than walking without you. More time loving you so our hearts become obedient to you. Not because we have to, but because we love you enough to please you. Motivate us, Lord, to touch other people's lives and love them. We know that pleases you, Lord. Lord, there might be someone here today who, bottom line is, they, they can't really say they know you. They know about you, but know you? And right now I ask that they would pray these words and say, Lord Jesus, I know about you, but today I want to know you. Save me from my sins. Be my defense attorney. Represent me. Give me pardon, forgiveness, and what comes along with that? Eternal life. Lord, we know if someone would just pray something like that, from the bottom of their heart, really meaning it because they believe in you, that you would change them from the inside out and they would see it, that they are real. They'd see it in the mirror themselves, that you are changing their life. Lord, for that person who's prayed that prayer today, I pray you would make their hearts genuine in faith that they might have assurance that I know him, not just know about him. This I pray in Jesus' name, amen.